We're going to introduce a new series of talk this morning out of the book of Galatians. And uh, yeah, someone's excited. I like that. Yes, someone's excited about the book of Galatians. And in order to get the most out of this, though, I want to challenge you to do three things, okay? Three things right off the bat that that if you're going to get the most out of this series, there's three things all of us need to do. And here they are. I want to tell you the three things real quick. First of all, you got to commit to every Sunday because it's eight weeks and each week plays off of each other. It's, it's a domino effect. It's a puzzle that we put together for the next eight weeks. So the first thing is you got to commit to eight weeks. Can I hear you say amen? amen. The second thing you got to do is join a crew for a deeper discussion. Crews are small groups that are happening starting this week. And we're going to have crews happening every Wednesday night for the next eight weeks right here in church. And if you can't make it in church... We have crews online, but crews are important because this is where now you can actually talk about it, have conversations, have questions, debrief, study together. And if you're going to get the most out of the series, you need a crew. Can you say amen? amen? And then the third thing that you need to do is get yourself a study guide to go along with the series, right? It's impossible to cover every single detail uh, when we're studying the Bible, but if you get a study guide, guess what? You can do some study on your own, and then you can bring it to your crew, and you guys can go deeper together. And we're going to have some of these study guides available today after service. We're using uh, theologian Warren Wisby's study guide on the book of Galatians for those who want to go deeper. If you can't find it here because it might be sold out, you can find it on Amazon because you probably have Prime and you can get it tomorrow in your house. Okay, shout out to Amazon. Um, I don't know why I'm giving Amazon a shout out. This message is brought to you by Amazon. I'm just, just joking. Some of y'all are getting weird. Don't get weird. Just a joke. So you need a study guide, right? Can you say amen to a study guide? Now, I don't know if you understand this. Each time you say amen, you said yes. So I don't know. Before we go any further, let's, let's establish that when you say amen, you mean like I'm with you. I'm with it. I believe that. So when we say amen, it means like we're going to do this. Don't be fibbing in church. Okay. So that's how you're going to get the most out of this series in the book of Galatians. Starting today, we're going to, we're going to introduce it. And, and when I introduce a series, it's always a crockpot feel, okay? Because it, it takes time to, to kind of establish some things before we go anywhere. So I just want to tell you right now, you got to have this mindset that we're going somewhere, right? And you got to lock in to, to, to understand where we're going with this because it's going to jam some of your some of your thinking and some of your perspective, Uh, but we all need to be jammed up a little bit so we can get a better understanding of what God wants to do in our lives. Can you say amen? Amen. So Galatians chapter 1, we're going to read the first 10 verses of Galatians 1 as we introduce this series. And it says this, it says, Paul, an apostle, sent not from man, nor by man, But by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. And all the brothers and sisters with me, to the churches in Galatia, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Verse 6, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. Verse 8. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say again, If anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Verse 10. 
am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I will not be a servant of Christ. Can you say amen? That is the word of the Lord, my friends, for us this morning as we begin to dive into the book of Galatians. A little background on this book to help us set the tone for where we're going. Galatia is a region where today would call it the Asia Minor region around the country of Turkey. This is where Paul went on one of his missionary journeys to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to those that didn't have the gospel yet. And I always have to preface this by saying that Jesus was Jewish. Jesus didn't have beautiful blue eyes and beautiful shampooed hair. (laughs) Jesus was a Jewish man who grew up in Israel who had Jewish roots. So the gospel begins with the Jewish roots. And this, and this is important because we're going somewhere with this. It was written by Paul around 50 AD, which is kind of cool because 50 AD is roughly around 15 to 20 years after Jesus had ascended to heaven. So this is pretty fresh. This is pretty new. The movement is still brand new. Christianity is growing. And Paul is bringing it to non-Jewish believers. So... Part of the struggle that you're going to see in this book is that there is this social and racial division between the Jews and the Gentiles. The Jews believed to be God's people. The Gentile was anyone who was not a Jewish person. Are you tracking so far? And so they're now being brought together by the gospel. The gospel is bringing Jewish people and Gentiles people into the same place. And there's some social and racial division happening because the Jews always believed that they were basically God's people and everybody else was kind of everybody else. Are you tracking? Because of this, there's some confusion around the nature of the gospel. In other words, what is actually the gospel and how does it affect us? So Paul is writing to address the tension that is social, that is racial, but also he's addressing how is it that we are being confused now by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what is the gospel and how it works? This is why I'm saying I, ha- I have to do a crockpot message to get us to where I believe God is trying to take us. Because I believe that is, this book is extremely relevant to where we are today in our society. Can you say amen? Now, when I say that, we have to understand this, my friends, that there's this, there's this misconception and there's an assumption that we all make. That the gospel is only for non-believers or brand new believers. It's a major misconception. It's a major assumption that actually is detrimental to the actual gospel and how it affects us. Sometimes people say, the gospel, oh, that's the ABCs of Christianity. At some point, you got to graduate from the gospel. At some point, you know, you need something more advanced than the gospel. But what you're going to find out in this next eight weeks is that Paul, the apostle sent by Jesus himself, is saying that through this book, this book of Galatians, he's saying that the gospel is not ABC. He's saying the gospel is actually the A to Z of living like a Christian. And that the mature believer needs the gospel as much as the brand new believer does. That the path of transformation that we really all want starts with understanding truly the nature of the gospel and how it works, and not just in us, but how it works in the community. So Paul is very interested, not just in this, in this Americanized individual gospel that just saves me, myself, and I. Paul is, is interested in the gospel that actually permeates communities and changes communities together so there's no social or, relation or racial division between us, but it actually bonds us together as God's people no matter where you're coming from. If, you, if you're familiar with Paul's writings, which, by the way, that was the technology of the day. That's how he could get the word out. Like, I believe if Paul lived in that day and age, 
Paul will use all the means necessary to get the gospel out. I believe Paul will probably have a Facebook account and an Instagram account, a TikTok account. You know, Paul, Paul will have a, a mom of YouTube, like whatever. Paul will use whatever means. And actually, Paul was actually create, uh, so creative that people say, historians say that his letters were revolutionary because he was doing something that most people weren't doing. He wasn't just using letters to just send, you know, dear mama letters. He was using letters to actually build local churches. Paul will plant the church and then he will move on to the next city and then he would write to these churches to follow up on them and also to address some of the issues that would surface as they begin to live out the gospel. So what we have is an incredible book that, that, that if we follow through, we're going to see that it's revolutionary. It's actually life-changing. It's actually full of joy. But first you have to establish where he's coming from. And most of Paul's writing starts this way. Paul will start to bring a greeting to the church and he will spend some time thanking God for the church. But when it comes to the churches in Galatia, Paul doesn't do that. Paul starts with a greeting and he goes right into this like rent. Paul is like a little bit upset. Actually, I would say Paul is a little heated. Paul's tone here is a little different from most of his books. Why? Because first of all, he is surprised. The word astonished means like... I can't believe this. I am surprised that after I preach the gospel to you, you're turning to something completely different, less than what Jesus had in mind for you. Remember, he says, I, didn't, I wasn't sent by another man. I was sent by Jesus himself. Like Paul was like, man, I'm on a mission from Jesus. I used to be a religious person. I used to be a Pharisee. I was persecuting the church. Jesus showed up to me and changed my heart and soul. And I brought the gospel to you. I'm surprised that you're going a different direction with your life. He's a little angry. He's angry at the people who have brought confusion to these churches. He's angry that people not just brought confusion, but that people actually drank the Kool-Aid. And embrace a different gospel. He's very emotional here. He's very human. I, I love that about Paul. He's invested in the people that he ministers to. Right? He's angry at these, these people were called the Judaizers. If you're taking notes, the Judaizers were, were the people that brought this confusion into these churches by preaching a gospel that is different. Basically, here's what the Judaizers were preaching. The Judaizers would come into the community and say, yeah, I, uh, we know that Paul told you about Jesus, but that's not enough. You need to follow the Jewish customs, you Gentiles. You need to embrace all of our customs, including... Circumcision. Now let's pause there for a second. Most of these Gentiles are coming to faith as grown men. We're talking first century. We're not talking go to St. Luke's and get under some anesthesia and get, you know, circumcised. We're talking old school knife and I don't want to go into too much detail, but I'm talking like this can make you sing soprano type of thing. <laughs> like this can make you make the worship team. Like you can go to a whole other level of note as a grown man being circumcised in the first century. So, so you can understand how some of these men are like, wait, wait, say what? I thought, I thought he sacrifice himself for us so now I gotta sacrifice that but it wasn't just circumcision in other words circumcision you have to understand this because it's powerful Paul says Paul says it later that listen circumcision was meant to be a symbol of the presence and the blessing of God on, on his people like it's, it's, it was set apart the people of God from everybody else but Paul later on says wait a minute no no that's the whole purpose of the gospel Jesus came to set you apart not to circumcise you physically but to circumcise you spiritually Paul says, what matters now is not circumcision of the flesh, but it's a circumcision of the heart. Is your heart set apart for Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of your life? But the Judaizers weren't just saying circumcision. They were saying all the Jewish customs, all the laws, all the rules, all the regulations. You've got to embrace that if God truly is going to approve of you. Do you understand why Paul is frustrated? Do you understand why Paul is angry? He's upset. Why? Because he knows 
that this is going to lead to a whole different ball game. And it's not going to lead to the joy and the freedom that Jesus had in mind for you. Because basically what you're doing is you're adding more religion and more tradition. And adding more religion and tradition never leads to more joy and more excitement and more freedom in the things that God has for you. That's why Paul is upset. He's so upset that his tone is like the tone of a parent who is starting to see the kids hanging with the wrong crowd. That's the perspective that Paul's coming from. It's like the father who says, man, I don't know, man, I'm getting a little bit worried about some of these people that you're hanging out with. In other words, you're not fully there yet, but man, I can see where this is going, where it's going to lead you. So Paul is a spiritual father. He's saying, man, I can't believe this. Like the gospel is so powerful. It's so awesome. It's going to lead you to freedom, but you're going to start to embrace things that actually are going to bring you right back to slavery. It's going to bring you right back to a morbid, dead religion that you were already part of. Are you tracking? And Paul was saying, man, I was sent. The word apostle means sent ones. I was sent by Jesus himself to bring you the gospel. That no one can change what the gospel actually is. And what does he do? He begins by, by once again bringing them back to what the gospel is meant to be. And I, my friends, I feel strongly about this, that we need to come back to the reality of what the gospel actually is. Because remember this, he's not writing to non-believers, he's writing to people in church. One of the assumptions is that, man, if you've been in church long enough that you know it, I think the longer you are in church, the more you run the danger of embracing something different than the gospel. So Paul says this, he starts here, he says, hey... Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave what? Himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of, of, of our God and Father to whom be, be glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul was like, man, can I bring you back to the reality of why you have what you have? You have the true gospel. The true gospel is that Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age. True gospel is that, my friends, you are helpless. You were lost. You need to be rescued. I love the way that Pastor Tim Keller puts it. Pastor Tim Keller says, listen, the word rescue there is for a reason because Because if you find someone drowning, you don't throw a swimming manual at them. And you certainly don't stop to lecture them about swimming. What's wrong with you? How come you can't swim? In other words... Jesus didn't come to lecture us. Jesus didn't come to throw his book at us. He actually came and dove in the deep end and rescued us. In other words, we don't need just a moral teacher or a nice teacher or good preaching. We need to be rescued because we were drowning in our sins, drowning in our sorrows, drowning in our unrighteousness. And he came in and he rescued us. And you can't take credit for that. Can you imagine being rescued from not being able to swim and then you go, you know, I really helped too, you know. Like, I laid down on his back, and I just hung on. Like, come on, I did something. Like, you would never hear someone who got rescued from drowning talk other than gratitude. What Paul was saying is, I'm, I'm astonished that you've lost focus of the fact that you are the one who needs a savior. You can't swim. He came to rescue you. The great understanding of salvation is the rescued mission of God. In other words, Jesus himself gave himself. He didn't give you a book. He didn't give you a manual. He didn't give you rules and regulations. He gave you himself. Gave him of himself. In other words, he's the substitutionary savior. He takes your place. In other words, he's saying, listen, don't you understand this? Like the gospel is that you supposed to be the one on the cross. But Jesus says, sub, father, I'll take their place. I'll die for their sins. I will, I will take everything on their behalf. That's the gospel himself, substitution. In other words, what we cannot do for ourselves, Jesus does for us. 
So we don't need a teacher. We need a savior because we can't save ourselves. You can't give what you don't have. The father accepts the sacrifice by raising him from the dead to say this is a perfect sacrifice that, that can overcome all sin and, and death. And you don't have to fear death. You don't have to live in, in worry of where you're going because Jesus already placed a staple of approval, a blessing over your life. And if you embrace that, you're embracing him, his righteousness, his goodness, his will. That's the gospel. He says, he says because of that, the father accepts it and he does what? He puts his grace any peace on you. What is grace? It's the unmerited favor of God. Like you don't earn that. You don't deserve that. You could be circumcised and I have the grace of God. You can be baptized today and I have the grace of God. And I have the peace of God. It's not the ritual that you're going through. It's what he's done in your heart that really matters today. In other words, my friends, his grace and peace is the outcome of his rescuing mission. If, if you experience something like drowning, a, a, a near-death experience, man, it changes your perspective on life. You become more grateful. You become more aware. You become more alert. You become more willing to help others because you've been in that situation. And so how do you know you've really been rescued? It's what you're willing to do now because you've been rescued. The thing is, we have to understand, my friends, but Paul is he's frustrated because he wants them to understand, my friends. Remember, salvation is God's doing from beginning to end. It's his calling. It's his plan. It's his action. It's his work. And, and, and when you fully understand that, then it's a humbling reality that I didn't get to play a role in any of this. And it's so humbling. Why? Because, because he says to me and you that we, we love to be our own savior. We love to say, I did something. Again, going back to this analogy of being rescued, like all you did was embrace the lifeguard. Hashtag rescued. Because <laughs> you got to document that moment. It's like, don't go anywhere. Hey guys, just want to hop on today, just to let you know how I was rescued. <laughs> Hashtag influencer. <laughs> because, because here's the thing with us, friends, all of us, is that we, we, we love self-salvation. It sounds so attractive, but it's only attractive to our ego and our pride. It's not attractive to God. Right? We love stories of self-salvation, right? We love that story of the people who say, man, I went to school in the blizzard. Uphill both ways, no shoes. I pull myself up by the bootstraps. And if you sign up right now, I'll teach you how to make money the way I've made it. <laughs> like we love those stories. Why? Because it feeds our ego and our pride. But it does nothing for the will of God. Like we love those stories and there's nothing wrong with working hard or something. But you know, it doesn't matter how hard you work, you cannot earn what only God can give you. I love how Pastor Keller again just defines the gospel. He puts it this way. I love this. He says, he says, he says gospel is the message that we are more wicked than we ever dare believe but more loved and accepted in Christ than we ever dare hope. That's the gospel, my friends. That's the true nature of the gospel. And you know what's interesting about this? Leave this up. Is that, is that the, the first part doesn't register until grace registers. In other words, the, the, the message that we are more wicked than we ever dare believe because everybody thinks they're good. It's not until grace hits home that you realize how wicked you are. Isn't that amazing? Sometimes in presenting the gospel, people do it wrong because they just want to talk about somebody's sin. But guess what? If gospel hasn't infiltrated your heart, you have no clue how sinful you are. How many of you guys would testify to the reality that it was when the grace of God hits home that you realize, oh my God, I am a mess. <laughs> Think about it. Prior to the grace of God invading your life, you made excuses for your sin. 
Matter of fact, some of us justified our sin and some of us fought for our sin. It's not until the grace illuminates the heart that you go, oh, homeboy's jacked up. I'm telling you, grace comes, then the revelation of sin comes. So if you're going to preach the gospel, you have to start with the grace of God. Then comes the reality of, oh my goodness, how far I am. You know what's amazing to me? It's fascinating. You can study this. Majority of people who really have a genuine understanding of the gospel and the grace of Jesus, majority will tell you, man, I'm the worst sin in the world. Paul himself says that. He says, I can't believe I'm the chief of sinners and Jesus has trusted me to be his missionary. Why? Because the more you realize who you are, the more you realize whose you are and how you got there and who's leading you. This is why we have to be careful to think this is only for new believers. Because you, you can start to think you're such a much and you begin to drift away from the actual gospel and you begin to buy into false narratives of what the gospel actually is. And I want to talk to you about three ways we do that today. Because we're not concerned about circumcision. Hopefully not. <laughs> that would be hilarious though if we're like out of service today instead of baptism. Circumcisions. <laughs> it's all set up in the bag. <laughs> How serious are you about the Lord? <laughs> You're about to show it today. You're going to learn today. Come back like, hi, honey. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to need two weeks out of uh, work. Who, who's this? It's, it's me, Jimmy. Jimmy? You, you sound different. I, I've been saved. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So that's what happens when you get saved. <laughs> but here's, my friends, there's three ways in the modern times that we can graduate from the gospel to something less than. Okay, this is important. All right, three ways. The first one is this whole, like, Jesus plus. Okay, Jesus plus. In other words, yes, you say you, 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 you accepted Jesus' sacrifice on your behalf, but... Some people come along and say, yeah, but you don't have the right beliefs and the right behaviors. How do you know it was real? And so we begin to now put more emphasis on our faith as opposed to the faith in Christ. Now, this is important. Follow me. Right? Now you become saved through the level of our faith. Not what Christ has done for us. And then that leads to what? It leads to our performance instead of Jesus' performance. That's the first danger of graduating from the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now it becomes about, here's how it comes. It's subtle. Pay attention because it happens in your life. Now it's about, I'm not praying hard enough. As opposed to, I pray because I already am accepted. Right? Now it becomes a guilt trip of, I'm not reading my Bible enough. I'm not giving enough. I'm not serving enough. Like, it's never going to be enough when it becomes about your performance. Because your performance, the Bible says, is nothing but filthy rags. And it will never suffice for the sacrifice that's already been done on your behalf. So the first danger is to buy into the danger of, I got to have the right beliefs and the right beliefs. Now, get this. This is important as well because the gospel, when, you per when the grace of God permeates you, you want the right beliefs and the right behavior. You're not trying to earn the right beliefs and the right behavior. It's actually the other way around. Because it's in you, then automatically begins to produce something out of you. Remember, this is the book of Galatians that is famous for the fruits of the Spirit, which we'll get into in a few weeks. But you, when you get to that place of the fruits of the Spirit, what is Paul saying? Paul is saying is you cannot produce any of those fruits. The Spirit produces it in you. In other words, it's not how hard you try, it's how hard you yield. Oh, that's a word, my friends. It's not, oh, I'm going to work really hard to do this, but it's more like I'm going to surrender so that it can be produced in me. 
That's the difference between a me-oriented works of the gospel versus I have the gospel and it permeates me and it transforms me from the inside out. Are you tracking so far? The second danger that I see in a modern day time is this concept of cheap grace. Here's what I mean by cheap grace. Cheap grace is there are some will come along and say, it does not matter what you believe as long as you are loving and a good person. I can hear this gospel a lot these days. It doesn't matter what you believe. Just be a good person and just be loving. And then the question you got to ask is, if that's all it took, then the question is, why did Jesus have to die then? Like, if I'm, a, if I'm good enough, then why all the means, I, why, why go through all the extremes of being sacrificed for the sins of the world? No, the reality is this, none of us are good enough. And the problem with, with starting the gospel with just be, just be a loving and good person, the, the follow-up question is, how do you define good? And who determines what's good? What if my good trumps your good? What if your definition of love is trumped by another definition of love? And who gets to define what love is and who gets to define what good is? Because if it's up to us, then that definition is going to be different from person to person. And so now we're buying into a narrative that's not the gospel because we're saying just be good, just be loving, and embrace your own truth. This is why it's called cheap grace because this means that, that there was no sacrifice. I don't need a sacrifice because I get to determine what I get to determine for myself. And that's a very modern gospel right now. And I, and I get how we get quiet because it jams up our thinking. Like, what's wrong with being loving and good? Nothing, but it doesn't mean you're saved. Right? You can read a newspaper. Such and such was drawn today. He was a really good person. Okay, you didn't get that. It's not about being good. It's about being saved. Did you get rescued? Because you could be good and drown. <laughs> oh, y'all ain't ready for this. That's a word. You could be the most amazing person in the world and you drown because you weren't rescued. <laughs> Happens all the time. The rain falls on the just and the unjust, Jesus says. So it's not about being good. It's about being rescued. Right? Because we all fall short. Breaking news. We're all sinful. The problem with this gospel is if you, if you think it's about being loving and a good person, then you start to categorize people based on what your definition of good is. Then we begin to qualify and disqualify people based on our version of goodness. We begin to say, that person over there will never get saved. Yeah. I've heard people say, man, why would you go to the prisons? Those people are vile. They're evil. And, and you're doing this. But as you're doing that, you should pay attention to this thumb that says, I'm vile and evil too. By the grace of God, I may not be in jail. But in spirit, man, we're all jacked up. It's a dangerous gospel when I get to determine what's good. And funny thing is, those people are always on the right side. You know, being tolerant and being open is a good thing. That doesn't mean it's a rescuing thing. And the last part of this, this is the most extreme part that happens, is we can embrace a Extreme legalistic gospel. The word legalism is when we add to what God has already said. And I get why this happens. It happens because the concern that Paul will, is going to address, if you stick with eight weeks, you're going to understand this. The concern is, oh, so that means you can do whatever you want. That's not what Paul is saying. Actually, Paul was saying, if you really understand the gospel, it frees you to serve. Not to self-indulge. But the problem is, if you, don't want, if you don't have that freedom, then you start to try to control it. And this leads to what a lot of churches do, which is extreme legalism. What does it look like? It looks like this. It, it's like imposing many rules and regulations. Like, a lot of us, if we can be honest, we came from churches that told us that, hey, yes, Jesus saves, but you must work really hard at keeping all the rules. Matter of fact, I'm not sure about your salvation because I can see you. It's, they'll tell you, 
you got to dress a certain way, talk a certain way, eat certain things, behave a certain way, date the right way, <laughs> worship the right way, have a tight schedule. In other words, it's very controlling. Let me, let me just make it more practical to you. In some churches, I am not saved because of what I'm wearing right now. In some churches, if I'm not wearing a shirt and tie, I'm not sanctified. Which is, which is very interesting because the Bible says that God doesn't look at the outward appearance. God goes straight to the heart and he knows what's going on. Are you, is your heart really circumcised? Because if you can be honest, some of the greatest crooks in America wear a shirt and tie. And some of them are in our churches. Some of them are in our political arenas. Some of them are bankers. <laughs> Hello, Enron. Some of <laughs> so it's not the outward. It's the internal that reflects the external. Because God goes straight to the heart. There's a danger of qualifying people based on external appearances. I could be wearing a shirt and tie, but my heart could be vile. So it's not just the external, my friends. And what leads, and you see this, and a lot of us have come from these backgrounds, that, that, that what happens with extreme legalism is that it leads to authoritative, very ritualistic, and only our tribe is right. And some people will tell you, there are certain denominations who know the gospel and others don't. If you don't belong to the right denomination, you might be damned. If you don't listen to these preachers, you might be damned. We begin to put categories on who gets to have the gospel based on our own baseline of legalism. Some people would say, this is blasphemy. How are you worshiping with all of this nonsense and noise? God doesn't like drums and guitars and lighting and it's like, which God? Because if you go back to the Old Testament, the worship team had thousands of people in them. The Old Testament worship team will say to this team, oh, that's cute. <laughs> like they had... Thousands of worship leaders leading the way. And God says, go ahead and make a joyful noise. How did he defeat the walls of Jericho? By marching around it and shouting and bringing heavy worship. Every time they would go to war, God's like, let the worship leaders go first. And set the tone for what we're doing. There was one time, my friends, in the Bible where King David was so excited that they got the Ark of the Covenant back, which meant the presence of God was back. And they were worshiping. And David was losing his mind. He was dancing like Fernando was dancing last night at our <laughs> banquet. If you want to know the difference between grace... And works, watch Fernando dance and then watch Freddie dance. <laughs> one is graceful, the other one's working really hard. <laughs> I love Fernando. Shout out to you, man. I, I love that you could care less. You just who you are. I love that about you. <laughs> Which reminds me of King David. King David is dancing his heart out, man. He's so excited because he loves God. He loves the presence of God. And the Bible says as he's dancing and he's having a good time in the presence of God, which, by the way, some churches you mentioned dancing, that means you're sinning. He's dancing and his wife is watching from the window in the castle, watching his, his, his husband and king dance. And she goes, this is full doing. And you know what David says in that moment? It's powerful. It's it's the power of legalism. You know what David says? I got kids in the room, so I'm going to keep it PG. The Bible says David never was intimate with her again. And she became barren, which is a symbol of dead religion who gives no life. Wow. 
In other words, you can keep a tight hands on people, rules, regulations, but if it's not producing joy, it's no longer the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit brings love, power, joy, <laughs> meaning. The greatest understanding of are you operating in grace or not is do you have joy? Because, because if it's not led by the Holy Spirit, then it's led by yourself. And when it's led by yourself, you have to feel like you're doing it really hard. And there's nothing sadder than see people who love Jesus lose the heart. Everything begins hard. It's hard to worship when you're not coming from a place of already belonging. It's hard to read your Bible when you're trying to earn points as opposed to read it because you love the word. It becomes rigid. And the problem is what happens over time is we throw the baby out with the bathwater. We say, I'm done. This thing is sucking life out of me. Not realizing, yeah, because, because you bought into a gospel that's less than. That's why a lot of people, you know, especially teenagers, listen, this is very important. They reach the age of 18. They don't want anything to do with the church. It wasn't Jesus that they didn't. They never met Jesus. They met legalism. <laughs> My friends, when you meet Jesus, man, it brings life brings healing, it brings perspective, it makes you joyful, not angry, judgmental, hypocritical, and sad. Nothing like meeting a religious sad person has no life, barren in the spirit. So as I end today, you got to ask the question then, how do we know we have the true gospel? How do we know we're not drinking the Kool-Aid? It's important to ask this question, and we're going to spend eight weeks on this. What does Paul say? We've got to go back to Paul. In verse 8, look what Paul says. But even if we, Paul puts himself in there. Even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. That's heavy. Paul was like, this is so serious that those people should be cursed. And he's like, even me, if I preach you a different gospel. So here's some practical applications as I end. So important to understand this. The gospel, my friends, is received. You don't arrive at it. You don't work hard to get the gospel. The gospel comes to you. The, matter of fact, a better way of putting it is the gospel invades you. Sometimes you hear people say, you know, this was going on in my life and this was going on, that's going on. And, I, and then I found God. And the question is, where was he? You don't find God. God finds you. God's the one that goes after you. God, matter of fact, if you can even think about God, because God's making you think about him. God's the one that's bidding you to come today to the waters of baptism. This wasn't your idea. Anytime you're starting with, you know, I did all of this, you already lost the gospel. No, all you did was receive and become aware of what the gospel actually is. You can't, you can't work and earn your way to God. If you could, Jesus didn't have to die. Every religion in self-help says, do this and this and this, and your life will go well. The Bible says, you can't do all of it, so I'm going to come down to you and bring you to me. So the gospel, my friends, is received, not arrived at. No one can alter it. So here's the thing you have to be careful with. You got to evaluate and judge all external teachers by biblical gospel passed down by the first apostles, not modern teachers, including me. If this gospel is going to take the test of time, it has to be that I got to go back to the original intent of the gospel, not what someone has fabricated over the years. You see, the Bible is the word of God. As a believer, we believe that God gave us his word. The Bible says that this thing is inspired by the Holy Spirit, right? To do what? To train us, to teach us, to correct us, to rebuke us, to become the man and the woman that God intended, right? So if that's true, then, then the Bible judges me, not the other way around. I don't get to decide what truth is. I don't get to decide what good is. If I'm truly in his will and in his purpose. See, 
this is going to rub against us in a, in, a, in, a, in a good way because our flesh will lie to us. But our personal experiences and feelings must be judged by the Bible, not the other way around. See, right now, the greatest idol of our time is feelings. We think because we feel something, that makes it right. But the Bible says, not every, everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. So hear me, my friends. We do not judge the Bible by our own feelings or convictions. We judge our experiences by the Bible. It's the other way around. This is what Paul was saying. Like, what are you doing? The gospel was freely given to you. Why are you flipping it around and making it about you and what you can do? When you stand before God, what can you off possibly offer God of the universe? You know what I think about when I think about that? I think about when my kids, when they were little, would make these drawings. They think they made the greatest masterpiece in the world. They're like, here, Daddy. And as a father, what do you do? You go, it's amazing. It's cute. That's us with God. Here, Daddy, look at my amazing works. It's like, oh, that's cute. Angel, put this with the other ones on the fridge over there. <laughs> it's really nice. My friends... Paul is ending here, and I end here with this warning. He says, listen, if you get this wrong, you're going to get nothing right. He says, to abandon the gospel is to abandon Jesus himself. It's to nullify what he's done for you on the cross. If we get Jesus wrong, my friends, everything else will be wrong. If you're getting baptized today, it's because of what Jesus has done for you. Your baptism is not your pass to heaven. Your baptism is just a reflection of what Jesus has done already in your heart. And you go in public so that others who are here who never met him can actually hear your testimony. And you overcome by the word of your testimony and by the blood of the lamb. Amen. A different gospel will lead to condemnation. See, people always think about hell in terms of afterlife, but you can live hell on earth with the wrong mindset. Always trying to prove yourself, always trying to earn something, always thinking that you're, you're good and you're just frustrating your soul because you haven't yielded yourself to the Lord. Some of you are like, I'm good. I just came to see my friends get baptized. And Jesus is like, I brought you here because I'm trying to, I'm trying to show you my love for you. I'm trying to show you that you need me as much as your friend does. So today, you've got to reflect on this stuff. Don't just assume because you've been in church for 10 years that you are in the, in the flow of the gospel, of his grace, of his will. Whether you're here for the first time or 100 times, only Jesus saves. Only him can rescue and keep you on the rescuing path of producing the right fruits. As we get to Galatians 4, 5, 6, you see that Paul was saying, listen, you missed it. What brings joy, what brings purpose, what brings meaning is when you are rooting in the gospel. And it produces life out of you. Stuff that you could never do in a million years. You can't produce love. You can't produce joy. You can't produce peace. doesn't matter how much you... Remember, have you ever tried this? You say to yourself, today I'm going to be really patient. It was the worst day of your life. Because you can't produce it. You can try really hard, but you can't produce it. That's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And what's the last fruit? Self-control. Some of y'all, you're going to show that the moment you live here, someone's going to cut you off. All the gospel's out the window. <laughs> With your self-control. Because <laughs> you can't produce it. And, and, and the beauty of that is God knows us. He's like, knuckleheads, don't you get it? Every day you need me. Every day you need self-control. Think about it. One moment without self-control could be detrimental to your life for a long time. So stand with me as we pray this morning. There's only one good news. It's that Jesus came to rescue us from our sin and death. And you accept that by faith alone, not by anything you can do. By nothing you can do. See, there's nothing you can do to make God love you more or less can't change his mind about the cross. The cross is a done deal. Nothing you can do. You can either 
embrace it and live his will, or you can continue to kick and scream and try to do it your way. That's why I titled this Bad News, Good News. It's like the people come to you and say, I got bad news and good news. Bad news is you're the problem. Good news is Jesus is the solution to your problem. <laughs> that, that's the gospel. So let's bow our heads as we pray this morning. I pray you allow the Holy Spirit to illuminate your heart. And if you're here today, you're like, man, you're, you're talking right to me. Not me, but the Holy Spirit, because I don't know you. It's amazing how the Holy Spirit knows us and speaks directly to us. And if you believe he's speaking to you today, I encourage you to open your heart and receive. Receive his gospel. Receive his grace. Receive his goodness. That you are more wicked than you realize, but you are more loved and accepted than you can ever imagine through the person of Jesus Christ. If that's you today, I want to pray that you would let him come into your life to forgive you, to empower you, to rescue you. And then we're going to baptize some friends, but if you pray that prayer for the first time, before you leave today, there's, you're going to see people with a sign that says, ask me about a free Bible. We'd love to connect with you and help you on this journey. It's a journey. It's a journey. All the way to eternity. So let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you are confirming this word in the hearts, minds, and souls of so many people right now, in person and online. And I pray right now, Holy Spirit, that you would help them to open their hearts to ask you to come into their lives, to forgive them their sins, to transform them from the inside out, to give them the true gospel that brings freedom and joy and eternity. So Holy Spirit, fall fresh on each one of us, especially those who are saying yes to, do for the, yes to you for the first time. And for our friends who are going to the waters of baptism, I'm believing right now that in that water there is an exchange happening, that the old is gone and the new has come. So Holy Spirit, have your way, not just with them, but with everyone in this room. I pray that no one will live life without being in the fullness of your gospel. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. And we all said, amen. 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 You may be seated. We're going to begin our baptism by watching this short video that explains the power of baptism. Jesus did for us in his death, burial, and resurrection. Being lowered in the water represents our old life dying. Just like Jesus was dead and buried, who we were and what we've done is dead. Our past and future sins are forgiven. When we were raised out of the water, we are reminded our new life is made possible because of Jesus' resurrection. We are a new creation. Today, we celebrate as people take their next step and tell the world how Jesus has brought them from death to life. We celebrate because they have a new life in Jesus. They have been made brand new. They are forgiven. They are a new creation. So tell us your name, right, and tell us why you decided to get baptized today. Um, so my name is Melanie. Um, so this past June, I got um, into a car accident, and it made me realize um, that I would have left everyone a life without me, that I worked so hard for, a life for my five-year-old son, um, a life for my mom and dad um, when they grow old, and just everyone who I've, I've treated, I'm a nurse, so I just thought about all those people. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's more than that. It's a relationship. It's a relationship that I've had with nobody, nobody that I've been able to open up to and just be myself. You know, you think you can be yourself with your friends and your family and your boyfriends and your girlfriends and your significant others, um, thinking that they'll understand, but there's, there's no one else. You know what I mean? Amen.
So tell us your name and, and why today? Why take the step? Sure. My name is Harry Noonien. Um, I took the step today because I have walked through life. I mean, you know, you know live, live my life without the Lord Jesus Christ, trying to make it through with, without uh, Jesus. And when Jesus came into my life, everything was better. Before it was not. And everything now is better. Everything now is well. And I want to show my gratitude. And I have made up my mind that from now on in my life, God is first. Everything else is second. God is first. Come on. Tell us your name, and I'm curious, like, we could be doing so many other things with your life right now. Why, why are you doing this right now? My name is Amy Hamrick, and I've grown up in the church. My dad has raised me in the church. My parents have raised me in the church, and um, I got married in the church. My children, I'm raising my children in the church, but lately God has been saying, there is more I require of you. And God is, this week, he has been requiring more. And the devil has tried. Even today, he has tried. But God, I am here, and I hear you, and I answer you. And devil, you can't have my marriage. You can't have my children. You can't have my family, because God requires more of me. And I am declaring that I have joy. My family has joy. My husband has joy, because the devil doesn't have him, because I belong to God. And today, in front of all these people and in front of God, I am accepting the call in my heart and my soul says yes. Amen. 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 And I want to declare to you that no weapon formed against you would prosper. Thank you, Jesus. So, tell us your name, but here's what I'm going to ask you. Like, you're a young man, and majority of your generation is, you know, just be a good person, just be loving. But why, why are you choosing Jesus? Well, my name is Sebastian. Um, well, I certainly was not like that. I did not think I, being good, being loving, I was actually the opposite. Um, so, I always believed in Christ my whole life, thought I was a Christian. Well, he wasn't and I started believing that my all my childhood traumas and and all my family stuff that happened in my family I thought that would be a repetitive cycle and I became a sad depressive person full of anger and frustrations and anxiety so I would put up this persona of what you would say that uh, being a good person charismatic cheering everyone up but deep down I was just hating myself and and yeah it was it was one night I was gonna take my life away and I, I asked God that if he really wanted me here please don't take my life away and 
that happened. And then a year and a half ago, I talked to my friend about everything for the first time because as a man, I always thought that no one wants to hear a man whine and complain about his life. So this was the first time I did it. And he shared the gospel with me. For the first time, I... For the first time, I... For the first time, I looked at Jesus in a different perspective. It was like the missing key of, like, missing piece of the jigsaw puzzle. I got the full picture. Well, not the full picture, but, you know, a little picture. I got the picture, but, yeah. <laughs> I got something. And after that, I started praying. After that, another friend gave me his own Bible, and I started reading the Bible. So I was praying and reading the Bible. And then my little brother got baptized in this church. And I got introduced to the church, and I started attending it. And now I'm right here, ready to get baptized. Thank you. Amen. You are a child of God. There is now, therefore, no more condemnation for those who are under Christ Jesus. So tell us your name and why, why Jesus? My name is Jan. And I just felt like I was walking through this life alone. I had so much stuff that I had to deal with. I always had to put on this facade like I was so strong and just be there for everybody around me. And I just realized that it was just not the way to go through life. I seeked so many different outlets to relieve the stress and the anxiety and the pain. And I just always came up blank. I felt like I was in a battle with myself every day and nobody knew I was just so alone. And I came to this church about a year and a half ago off of a friend's suggestion. And it's truly changed my life. I've never felt so supported, unconditionally loved, able to be honest with myself and just put my, my who I truly am into this world and get what I'm supposed to get out of this world because of Jesus. And I just am eternally thankful and grateful for this community and for this space to be able to grow in the faith and he's just released so much pain from my life and just allowed me to open new doors and just see the opportunities and the purpose that I am actually fulfilling in this life in his word and I just this is where I'm supposed to be this is where I'm supposed to be Uh, man, you you got to tell them a little bit about your story because your testimony. Last year wasn't going so good for me. My marriage was a mess. I was depressed. I had anxiety. I came here with my wife so she could get baptized. And it's been a great journey so far since I've been coming here. And you're one of those people that came to church because your wife was getting baptized, right? And so what's happened since? My marriage is better. My life is better. I'm not depressed. I don't have anxiety. Everything's better. Oh, no. Come on. Man. 
So tell us your name and what has Jesus done in your life? My name is Melissa and Jesus has overcome struggles with me, has helped me fight depression and anxiety and he has helped me to conquer things that I never would have imagined I could. Good. So tell us your name, right? First of all, how old are you? I'm 18. You're 18. That is awesome. That's awesome. It's so awesome. I'm going to testify for you. <laughs> that the earlier you give your life to Jesus, the less you have to undo later on. So tell us why you're taking this step today. So I'm taking this step today because I've just been so going through the motions, just walking through life with no purpose, no meaning, just going. And it's like, now that I come to church, I have real friends, real people to go to, and it's just something that, there's nothing like it. It's just an amazing thing that Jesus has done. And, it's, and I know there's just the beginning. Bless you. So tell us your name, and listen, we don't get tired of hearing it. What has Jesus done for you? My name is Latoya, and at once I felt like I wasn't going to live to see the age of 30. And um, well past that now, and, <laughs> and, <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. So um, what Jesus has done for me is he let me he take my hurt and my pain and my life experience and he, um, now I'm in a position to help others and, and try to be a positive change in their life. And I just want to say God's been calling me for a long time, and I'm answering. So tell us your name and, and what, and listen, last night you were having, you were having a day. We, we had a banquet last night and this man was dancing like David danced. So Jesus must be good to you, man. Tell us about him. My name is Cletus. Um, Jesus, uh, he saved my life uh, from past bondages, past uh, uh, mental illness, depression, anxiety. Uh, he, 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 through the grace of God, uh, there's been a few instances where he has brought me back to life and I should not be here. And I, I truly believe I am here for a reason. I still have work to be done. I still, I still have uh, uh, children to guide. I still have a life to live. And I want to help as many people as I can and live in Jesus' name and make him proud. And that's why I'm here. Amen. Bless, man.
people clearly want to hear your story, so tell us. My name is Patricia, and my life was once filled with paranoia and fear. Today, because of the God that I serve, it's now filled with joy and a healthy fear of the God that I serve. I'm so grateful for him, and thank you for loving me the way that you do. And I am now going to set a beautiful example for my three children. Tell us your name and, and what, why today? My name is Aleda, and to be very honest with you, I've been coming to New Life for almost five years. Uh, different ministries, um, women's shelter, pantry, everything else, and I'm like, what are these people, crazy people doing? Like, I want that. I wanted that, and this is why I'm doing that today. Amen. Welcome to crazy. I see that it's so important to you. You prepared a speech. You want to hold it? I once was lost, alone, broken, and living life my own way. Now, I am living life with Jesus by my side. My relationship with him has been restored, and my faith has been renewed. Jesus, I thank you for saving me and never leaving my side, for giving me hope and loving me with no limits for listening to me cry out and answering all my prayers. Thank you for blessing my life continuously and abundantly. And thank you for bringing me to a new life, a church I call home. So tell us your name and share a brief testimony of what Jesus means to you. Hi. Uh, my name is Jacqueline, and God brought me here. Um, I know I was lost after losing my dad, who I had a very estranged relationship with, and I was angry with myself, and... I have learned to forgive myself because Jesus had already forgiven me and let go of those things, the hurt, the pain that I carried for so long and just surrender. So I want the Holy Spirit to just wash over me and just fall fresh upon me and for Jesus to have his way with my life, my family, my children, my marriage, and my everyone I encounter, so. God bless you.
No, the word says the last shall be first. So you're in a good place. Tell us your name and why today. My name's Noel LaRue, and uh, today God's brought me here. Um, that was my wife that was just up here, and uh, that was very beautiful to watch. And um, and I told her that um, the most beautiful thing that I've seen is when I watched my wife pray. The reason why I'm here is God's taken me uh, through many battles. Um, I was an alcoholic for 13 years. I drank every day. I uh, contemplated suicide for many years. Um, I've gone through many struggles, and, and I found God. And I'm here to surrender my life to the Lord Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And um, the, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. I'm here to cast my worries, my anxieties, my fears, my troubles, and my battles at the Lord's feet. And I'm here to ask him to be my Lord and Savior. And today, I surrender my life to him. Amen. Is God good or what? Come on, let's stand together and let's worship one more time and let's bless God for what he's done in our midst. Come on, let's celebrate. 